Hey, so um, hello everybody and uh, welcome to the uh, third session this year of the uh, GATCO Balpa Controller Pilot Symposium. Um, and our session for this morning is entitled uh, Our Impact on the Climate and Its Impact on Us. Uh, Phil, would you mind stopping screen sharing now? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, so welcome everybody. Um, this is actually the third session in the symposium this year. So previous sessions this year um, have included um, a panel discussion um, reflecting on the lessons we've learned from the pandemic um, and also a look at automation and AI in aviation. Um, today, as I said, we're looking at um, our impact on the climate, its impact on us. Um, we're extremely fortunate to have a really great panel of speakers who've given up their uh, time to talk to us today. Um, so we're going to go through the agenda for the moment, um, just a couple of uh, rules of the house. So for um, all the attendees, if you could make sure that your mics are off, please, um, just so we don't get any breakthrough, that would be great. Um, the session is being recorded, um, it will be available uh, by catch up link afterwards. Um, and if you can ask any questions you have, we're going to save those for the end when we have a panel discussion. If you can ask any questions through the Q&A function, which you should find on the menu at the bottom of your screen, that's probably the easiest way to do that. Uh, so coming on to then um, our agenda for today. Uh, so uh, here with us, um, the first person we have speaking is uh, Jeremy Thompson. Uh, Jeremy is chair of our environmental study group in Balpa, and he's going to give just a quick overview of what the study group does. Uh, then we're going to have uh, Didier Moraine talking to us. Uh, so Didier is um, a captain for ASL Airlines in Belgium. Um, he is a, a director of the European Cockpit Association and holds lots of roles in there. Um, he's an FTL fatigue management expert, a developer of the EU FTL calculator app, um, and also a member of the ECA um, Environmental Task Force. Um, and also a committee member of the Belgian Cockpit Association and a uni representative. Um, and Didier is going to talk to us about uh, SAFs and their role to play in decarbonising aviation. Um, after that, we're going to have um, Adam Durant um, here talking to us. So uh, Adam is founder and CEO of Satavia, um, who's a software and data analytics company based in Cambridge. And they work with airlines making flying greener by preventing aircraft contrails and the associated climate impact. Um, Adam was previously a scientist and held positions at Bristol and Cambridge universities and um, is an adjunct professor at Michigan Tech at the moment. Uh, so Stavia is partnering with Etihad and actually did the first commercial contrails avoidance flight on the 23rd of October. Uh, saving 64 tonnes of uh, CO2 in that flight alone and hopefully paving the way for scaling of the capability um, and Adam is actually joining us today from the Dubai Air Show so we are uh, very very thankful to him for giving up his time to talk to us um, and he's going to talk to us about uh, controls avoidance and how you can put that into practice. Um, and then last but by no means least uh, we have Professor Paul Williams uh, so Paul is Professor of Atmospheric Science at the University of Reading. Uh, since receiving his PhD in Physics from Oxford in 2003, um, he's specialised in atmospheric modelling, turbulence, jet streams and climate change. Um, he's published two books and over 50 scientific papers. Um, he's a fellow of the Institute of Physics and the Royal Meteor Meteorological Society. Um, and what Paul is going to talk to us about um, is actually flipping things around slightly. So what the effects of climate change might be um, on aviation and how we can expect to have to adapt to that. Um, so like I said, a um, really great panel of speakers to you today. Um, ask questions to the Q&A panel during the talks by all means. What we'll probably do is come back to them and answer all questions at the end in the panel discussion there. Uh, so uh, that's probably enough for me. Uh, so uh, now I'm going to hand over to uh, Jeremy for our first talk. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in for this session. We do appreciate that. Uh, my name is Jeremy Thompson. I'm a 320 First Officer operating out of Heathrow. And I've also been a volunteer on the Balpa Flight Safety 
uh, division for a few years, initially with the Air Traffic Services Group. About a year ago, we started to think um, it was about time that Balpa considered environmental sustainability issues, which is not something it worked in before and didn't really have a position. Uh, and as these things tend to go, I ended up forming the group myself and being volunteered to chair it. So I'm now chairman of the Environment Study Group as well. Now we started out quite small with relatively small ambitions, and we would mainly look at um, small efficiency gains such as single engine taxi, reduced APU use, and other initiatives that could make uh, small improvements to fuel burn and reduce emissions. We put out a request for more volunteers and we had an amazing response. So the group is quite large now. We have about 20 people with expertise in all sorts of areas. Once that happened, we needed to organize ourselves a bit better. So we divided up the group into different areas. Um, and we decided to do one section looking at the science and research of climate. Another section looking at design and technology in response to that. Some people looking at regulations and targets to do with the environment. Uh, Jess runs our comms and media section. And finally, the original idea, which was to have small operational efficiency campaigns and improvements. As we got better connected and did more research, we found that um, our initial ideas were really completely wrong and our role was very different to what we expected. The pace of change in terms of the scientific research but also the regulations and legal requirements that are headed in the direction of the aviation industry are absolutely massive. We really didn't appreciate um, how big the changes that are coming are and how quickly they're coming. So her role has really changed from making small improvements to trying to make sure Balpa understands the regulations that are on their way, that is ready for them, reacts to them and can deal with them in a way that hopefully protects our jobs as well as improving our environmental footprint. To that end, the group has been involved in some government consultations recently. Uh, initially, there was one on air passenger duty, which we put some small input in, essentially asking for some of that funding raised from air passenger duty to go towards environmental research and improvements. Uh, then there was a much more substantial piece of work, which you may have heard of, called the Jet Zero um, consultation. Now, Jet Zero is the UK government's strategy to meet their target of net zero emissions, specifically in aviation. And for the first time this June, aviation has been included in those targets, and it's a legally binding target. We put in quite a substantial uh, input into that consultation, and we're waiting for the results, which are due out early next year. And when those are out, they will show us the pathway that will be expected to follow to achieve our emissions goals. Uh, and finally, there was a, separately from that, there was a parliamentary transport committee inquiry, which was initially focusing on the COVID response, but also had some issues on what they like to call build back better. So how you could incorporate some environmental improvements with the recovery of the sector. Having made all those consultation responses, we realized we had something that was looking close to an environmental position for Balper. So we reassembled all of that. We presented it to the various bodies uh, in Balper, and we're now very pleased to say we're at the point of having an environmental position approved and published for the very first time in Balper's history. During that work, we found out a huge amount of information and some really exciting areas where environmental improvements can be made. And two of those you're going to hear about today. The first one is sustainable aviation fuels, which Didier is going to tell us about, which really is the only short to medium term solution we have to reduce our carbon output. And there's lots of different ways of achieving it, and I'm sure he'll tell you more. Another one, which is really scientific research, which is happening right now, is telling us that the global warming impact of aviation is much more complicated than just the CO2 emissions alone, which is good and bad. It's bad because we're actually causing more warming than we thought, but it's good in that warming can actually be addressed. And Adam Durant is going to tell you more about how and why that works. And finally, this is not a one-way street. This is not just aviation trying to clean up its act and to make its part in the net zero goal, but we also have to be ready and realistic. The climate is changing and the climate is gonna have its effect on our operations. 
we can expect more turbulence, more rainfall, stronger winds, and all sorts of other challenges. And Professor Paul Williams is going to give us a presentation focusing on how the climate affects us. During these presentations, which I hope you'll enjoy, uh, I'll be watching the questions and answers. So do put those in. Um, you'll see there's actually two things available to you, a chat, which you're welcome to use. But if you want to pose a question directly to the panelists, please use the Q&A function in preference. I'll collate those and we'll ask them at the end and they can be answered by any of the three panelists. Well, that's all for me. Let's uh, start with our first presentation. Well, you should see my screen if, if, if everything is working. Perfect. So I'm going to, uh, to talk today about sustainable aviation fuel. But before jumping in the presentation of SAF, I would like to start my presentation with, with this idea of uh, putting a global cap on CO2 emission. This is something coming from uh, the SHIFT project, which is a French uh, think tank. If you take here a graph coming from a previous report of the IPCC, where you have the cumulative carbon dioxide emissions since pre-industrial levels and the impact on global warming. And if we want to achieve a limit, limiting the temperature increase to two degrees above the pre-industrial level with a 76% of probabilities, we see that humanity can emit a maximum of roughly 3,400 gigatons uh, since the pre-industrial levels. The budget we still had, we still had in 2018 until the end of the century is 1,170 gigatons. If we lower it for the period until uh, 2050, what we can emit is 844 gigatons of CO2. In 2020, 18, aviation emitted 1.1 gigaton of CO2. It's 2.56% of the global emission, meaning that budget for aviation uh, will be roughly 21.6 gigaton of CO2. That's what we can emit uh, by 2050, where we should be net zero carbon. This corresponds to an annual geometric reduction of 3.39% means that every year we need to decrease our reduction by 3.39%. The longer we wait, the steeper will be the slope. And here I put the Corsair objective, which is only to limit the growth of aviation and the emission. It's not the same objective. So what are the main mitigation strategies for aviation? Of course, we will have the technological improvements, the use of low carbon fuel via biofuel and electrofuel. That's what I'm going to present now. Via optimized air traffic management for minimizing CO2 and non-CO2 effect that will be discussed later. And obviously by reducing air travel volume compared to the business as usual. And I apologize for the choice of the picture. It's coming from an old presentation here. Main pathway for the sustainable aviation fuel, biofuel and power to liquid or electrofuel. For the biofuel, we have the EFA pathway. EFA means hydrogenated ester and fatty acids. The feedstock are waste and residue lipids, such as cooking oil, as well as purposely grown oil trees, such as the jatropha, which are grown on degraded land. But the majority of the output from hydro processing plants today goes to substituting diesel in the road transport as opposed to producing EFA for aviation. Alcohol to jet or the ethanol route, the feedstock for this technology, which is now being piloted commercially, includes any biomass that can be transformed into ethanol. Sustainable feedstock includes forestry residues, wood processing, and agricultural residues from mills or collected from fields and nature. Industrial waste gas can also be used as a feedstock. 
gasification and fissure troughs, use a similar feedstock as alcohol to jet, plus the municipal solid waste. The feedstock is then gasified to produce syngas. It's a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, which is subsequently fed into a fissure trough reactor, where it combined into a mix of hydrocarbons in the presence of a catalyst. That's for the biofuel. And next to that, we have the power to liquid, which I'm going to develop in detail a little bit later. For the biofuel, we rely on resources. Resources in Europe for the biofuel production, for the FA will be for the, the residue lipids, for the alcohol to jet, anything, any biomass that can be transformed into ethanol, and for the gasification, fissure trop, the municipal solid waste. Feedstock available. Well, we see that uh, for the FA, the resources worldwide are quite scarce compared to alcohol to jets and gas fissure trop pathways, which rely on a much more abundant resources. However, even if we have much more resources, there are still some sustainability concerns because these resources, of course, are used today by the biosphere. And we need to think about how much of these residues we can use in a sustainable manner. And of course, we will have also to solve a problem of fragmentation of the resources. Electrofuel or power to liquids are synthetic liquid, liquid fuel created from three different feedstocks, renewable electricity, carbon dioxide, and water. The renewable electricity is used uh, via electrolysis to produce hydrogen and used as well to capture the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere via direct air capture process. Then we mixed this hydrogen and this carbon into a fissure trop synthesis to produce dropping fuel or e-fuels. The mass balance is interesting. To produce one liter of e-fuel, we need roughly four liters of only four liters of water. And you need to compare that with some requirement for biofuel. A little bit less that today, uh, 100 megajoule of electricity and three kilos of CO2. What does it mean for the main resource that we need to produce um, electro electrofuel, which are electricity? I give you an example of the output we can expect it from one offshore wind turbine of three megawatts. It's a standard uh, wind turbine. If you multiply this, three megawatt by the number of day, hours, and the capacity factor of the UK offshore, 45%, which is not bad. Roughly, this uh, offshore wind turbine will produce 12,000 megawatt hour per year. Using the, 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 the amount of electricity we need to produce um, electrofuel, we may expect that this wind turbine will produce between 200 344 and 416 tons of kerosene. Knowing here the, uh, the energy density of kerosene, we can have the conversion efficiency of our electricity to kerosene, which is for the moment between 37 and 45%. That's what we can do right now. But um, we expect that this uh, conversion efficiency will improve to above 50 and maybe reach uh, 60% in the next decades. So a weekly return flight at a medium distance like the London Barcelona with a 50% blend of electrofuel, so 50% electrofuel and 50% of other uh, fuel, like the fossil fuel, we, we need about 360 tons of electrofuel. That's what we can achieve with one wind turbine, only one. But you understand now that the amount of electricity to develop this SAF pathway is enormous. Uh, some study um, 
estimated that the amount of energy uh, in 2050 will be higher than the uh, amount of electricity required for the battery electric passenger car. So probably amount 500 terawatt hour. To give you a point of comparison, uh, in the EU in 2019, uh, the amount of electricity produced was 280, 200, two, sorry, 2,800 terawatt hour with a little bit more than 52%, which was already renewable electricity. So we will have to develop a lot production of renewable electricity. Extra cost give you a point of comparison. In 2018, fuel accounted for around 23.5% of airline operating expense. The medium near-term estimation for electrofuel costs is about 2.4 euro per liter, so 3,000 euro per ton. It's more than four times the price of fossil uh, uh, kerosene for the moment. Long-term cost should lower this to 1,500 euro per ton, it's of course directly linked to the renewable electricity cost. So the impact on the passenger tickets with different blending mandates is uh, I de depend of this on, of this mandate. With the two percent on a, a European flight, uh, Berlin Mallorca, we will have an increase of three euros per passenger. For a ten percent. Uh, blend, blending mandate, 15 euros, and for a uh, 50% of powerful man, uh, blending mandates, it will increase the ticket price by 50%. You find the same ratio for the long haul flights. So, lots of experts recommend that we develop sustainable, sustainable aviation fuel in a three step approach. Initially, to focus on the FA uh, biofuel, which is the only mature technology we have today, but we have few resources available. To develop alcohol to jet gasification, but this technology needs technological developments. At least we have more resources available in Europe. And the last step will be the power to liquid or electrofuel, which needs also techn technological development will be directly linked to the cost of renewable electricity, but will rely on an unlimited resources. Feedback from the European Capital Association Environment Task Force. Uh, we agree that we need to invest massively on research and development on biofuel and electrofuel. We should take in Europe and in UK leadership on power to liquid technology. We should have a more ambitious mandate uh, on, L, on uh, power to liquids, and we need to develop in the same time direct air capture of CO2. We will need it to produce power to liquids, electrofuel, but we will need also this technology to compensate for the carbon we will continue to, uh, to emit in, uh, after we will be zero or net zero emission. SAF will need subsidize. One idea will be to use the maybe coming tax on uh, fossil jet fuel to subsidize SAF. So you increase the price of fossil fuel, but you use this to compensate for the higher price, price of, of SAF. And very important, we need a prioritization of SAF for aviation. We won't have enough uh, clean carbon fuel for everybody in the future. Uh, we should not use these technologies for the road transport, except the heavy road transport, maybe. That they need to have a prioritization for aviation. Conclusion, EFA is the only technology mature we have today, but there is a risk to rely too much on its scale resources because everybody and all the airlines wants to go green. But we need to be very careful with this technology. And it's already used in the road transport. So it is unlikely that there will be a massive shift from biodiesel to biokerosene. It will be very difficult to achieve. Alcohol to jet and gasification fissure traps may require 10 years to scale up. 
but we have more potential resources in Europe, but you need to, take, need to think that there will be a limit to what we can collect at sustainable level from agricultural and forestry residues. To be note, power to liquid are not yet included as part of the Corsia eligible fuel. This will be uh, reviewed uh, in the third ICAO conference on aviation alternative fuel. The schedule to be occurred before 2025. There's no fixed, the date is not fixed yet. So power to liquid provides a more scalable source of renewable energy, the renewable electricity compared to the biomass feedstock. It's still at a very early stage of development. The main driver of cost production is the cost of electricity. It's also in line with the hydrogen strategy in Europe because you need to produce hydrogen. The only additional step is to mix this hydrogen with carbon, but we need a new way to produce uh, hydrogen massively in Europe for other purposes. And it's a step for the rest of the presentation. Uh, Biofuel, but also so, uh, certainly power to liquids, is likely to reduce the formation of contrail because it will produce less suit. Voila. So we will rely in the future a lot on this sustainable aviation fuel, and we need to develop both biofuel with the limits of sustainability, and we need to invest as soon as possible in the most promising technology, which is the power to liquids. Thanks for your attention. Great. Um, thank you very much, um, Vatilio. That was really a fascinating talk. Um, and it's great you took us through, you know, both the opportunities that are there with SAFs um, and also the challenges in terms of scaling up um, and costs. And it was great to see that actually put into um, you know, practicalities of extra price on tickets. Um, so I think hopefully it gives us all a you know, good idea of uh, the challenge that does face the industry. Um, and thank you also for that absolutely perfect link onto um, our next talk, uh, which is going to be looking um, at a sort of different way in which aviation um, currently does affect the climate. Um, and that's all about contrails. Um, so, uh, Adam, now, uh, if you could take over, we're very much looking forward to what you have to say. <laughs> thank you very much. Hopefully you can all hear me clearly. Apologies for the background noise. I'm actually coming live from the Dubai Air Show. So hi, everybody. My name's Adam Durant, Chief Executive of Satavia. We're a, a, a software and data analytics company based in, in Cambridge. Um, and we built a team that combines uh, people with backgrounds in data science, AI, software engineering, aerospace engineering, and atmosphere and climate science. And all of that ends up um, being built into the software uh, that we develop. So we're aiming to make aviation smarter uh, and greener, uh, and we're working with airlines to enable them to do smarter flying to uh, minimize their non-CO2 climate impact, um, specifically to avoid making contrails through smarter flight planning. Um, so, why is it, so why is this an issue? So the latest science says that maybe up to two thirds of the overall climate impact of flying across all flights comes from the non-CO2 effects. So we all know that you burn kerosene, you emit CO2, that causes warming. Aircraft also make clouds called contrails, which are clouds of ice crystals, and they also emit NOx and soot. But just focusing on the contrails, relative to about 32% overall of the impact coming from the carbon emissions, 59% comes from the clouds that the aircraft make. And that's research that's come out of Manchester Metropolitan University, DLR, Imperial College, and other places. Um, and that's when we're combining CO2 sitting, sorry, comparing CO2 sitting in the atmosphere for 100 years against uh, aircraft contrails that last minutes or hours in the atmosphere. So that is the, the setting the scene. The solution is, a data analytics solution. So with weather forecasting technology we have today, flight plans um, can be adapted just by changing flight levels or changing routing to avoid flying through regions of airspace 
which are saturated with respect to ice crystal formation. So where you've got very wet atmosphere at cruise altitudes, we can plan to fly above, below or route around, and that can actually prevent the clouds that the aircraft make. What we're also trying to develop is a carbon credits methodology for the operators. We're already in progress uh, to do this. So this would incentivize the operators with credits for taking this action relative to the amount of forcing that we've prevented. Um, so we're currently focused on uh, voluntary carbon markets. Um, we're in progress with gold standard, but actually we would like to start a conversation with ICAO um, and already um, start thinking about how this could fit into Corsia. So what we can offer today and what we're actually doing is um, giving data intelligence layers that fit into existing flight planning software, also electronic flight bag software and ANSB software. So this is really about making the most uh, effective uh, flight plan to avoid flying through these regions whilst minimizing any additional fuel burn. And then also having um, information available via the connected uh, EFB on the flight deck for any tactical changes that may need to be made. And also having a cooperation with the ANSP. So that's, that's critically important. So this is what the product looks like. Um, so we've got these layers that we do a forecast that runs over 24 hours. We, we generate these, these this is probability of forming persistent contrast. So contrasts that are going to last long enough to have a climate impact. Um, and we do this at 60 levels up to flight level 600. So the idea is that these, these fit into, for example, existing flight planning software, and you can then automatically adjust and optimize the flight plan uh, around these regions of airspace. We've also done a lot of validation. So the technology itself has been developed um, on the back of an Aerospace Technology Institute project. We had funded to work alongside Rolls-Royce and GK and Aerospace focused on small ice crystals. So high altitude ice crystal icing conditions. Uh, we've built the technology to build a climatology of those conditions to support icing certification of the ultrafan engine. So it's, it's been over three years that we've been developing this capability. And it was a logical step then to make, to, to identify contrail forming regions. So we're looking for regions where there's high humidity with respect to ice. Um, and so you can see on the top right here, we've got our forecast product. The lower right is, is an overlay of that on top of uh, an earth observation image captured at the same time in this example over the Bay of Biscay. So we're doing a lot of this, um, this, this correlation. We've also um, done a lot of work validating the inputs to our contrails model. So I've already mentioned the, the various ways that we're technically aiming to take this to, to market. So the core technology we've developed is called 5DX, enables us uh, and others to create this digital twin of the Earth's atmosphere. So it's a software platform-based technology. It runs in the commercial cloud um, and it delivers these um, contrails products, API into pieces of software. So I'm just going to end by talking about um, our, our partnership with Etihad. So uh, I'm in Dubai today uh, because I've just signed an agreement with Etihad. So we're going to be working for the next year together on contrails avoidance. We're going to be doing up to weekly uh, contrails flights. Um, so closely partnered with the flight ops division uh, and ultimately gradually getting more integrated into the flight planning system and process. Uh, but we did a flight on the 23rd of October, also Boeing involved, um, where it, in the context of their Greenliner uh, initiative. So there are a whole range of interventions that were done pre-flight, during flight, um, to prevent the overall climate impact of this flight. So it was flying on 38% um, blend of sustainable aviation fuel. Um, Boeing provided some capability that, that optimized the trajectory during flight to, to get the most efficient uh, climate descent profiles. Uh, and we did control avoidance during this flight. Um, so here's pictures of how it actually happened. So as this was the first time it was ever done, um, it required me to be there in person. So I spent a few days in the flight ops room learning about how their process worked, getting to know the people involved at the dispatch uh, desk. Um, and so that was critically important. And also uh, on the right hand side, we had the, the airlines Boeing uh, 787 type pilot uh, involved in the flight. So he was in constant communication with Eurocontrol in this case, and we had 
special flexibility to, to make altitude changes for this flight. Um, so here's an example of the original uh, flight plan. So this was generated using their flight planning software. We ingest the flight plan into our, our software platform and then analyze along that trajectory for the environmental conditions uh, and conditions that lead to contra formation. So the red areas there, we're trying to avoid flying through them. You can see that original flight plan uh, was, was scheduled to go directly through this region, which turned out to be over the Black Sea. Um, and so we also have a model that calculates the lifetime of that cloud and then its overall uh, forcing. Uh, and we express that in terms of CO2 equivalent units. So that's the amount of heating that this would do um, in the same context as, as, as the mass of CO2 that would generate the same heating. Um, so about 64 and a half tons uh, was our estimate. We looked at various scenarios um, flying below these regions, we had about two different scenarios for flying below. Um, and then it, through close coordination with airport operations, um, it, the, the aircraft was fully booked, 100% load factor because it was marketed as a sustainable flight. So very successful at filling the seats. It was fully loaded with cargo as well, but we made the decision to take, um, I think about a ton and a half of cargo off so that the aircraft could fly higher. So we were able to create this flight plan uh, and file it. Um, the reality was the aircraft was about two hours late leaving. Um, and then at about hundred minutes into the flight where the pilot wanted to ascend, there was an Emirates A380 sat at 390. Um, because we had this uh, already agreement with um, Eurocontrol, they were able to vector the Emirates aircraft out of the way, yet it aircraft climbed a little bit later than we wanted, but still avoided flying through most of those contra forming conditions. So overall, when you look at the actual flight plan here, uh, well, flight path uh, relative to the original flight plan, there's a difference of just over 64 tons of CO2 equivalent. And we had a fuel penalty of just over 100 kilos of fuel, uh, which is about 0.3% on this flight. Um, so we were really delighted with the result. Um, and, and we proved that this, this can actually be done. So the next 12 months are going to be all about doing more of this, gathering lots of um, evidence um, to show, to, to basically validate um, that, those, those initial forecasts. So here's an example of how we're doing it. Um, this is the flown ADSB trajectory. That is our original forecast there. Uh, and now we're looking at satellite imagery that was collected after the flight uh, took place. Um, sorry, this was taken a, a few hours before that, that time step I showed you, but after the flight's taken place, we can, we can pull this together. And you can see that there are some contrail streaks uh, and cirrus in the location that we were predicting at roughly the same time. Um, so to put it into context, we then the next day analyzed all of Etihad's flights that took place between the Middle East and Europe. So that was 130 flights. We went flight by flight, put it through our software, uh, analyzed for contrail forming conditions and, and then contrail climate forcing. So 130 flights, 28 created contrails. Of those 28, the top 10 um, produced about 90% of, of the climate forcing. So we estimate over 4,000 uh, tons of CO2 equivalent forcing from just 10 flights. So in an operational mode, we would be doing a, a longer term forecast the day before to target particular flights the following day that we would then do flight plan optimization on. So fully scaled, we're looking at only about 5% of an airline schedule to solve 90% of the contrails problem. Um, and we're also, we've got MOU signed now with some of the largest software, uh, flight planning software providers, which means that we will be doing the technical integration, uh, which will mean this will become part of flight planning without adding extra overheads. So that's me. Um, thanks very much. Um, delighted to take any questions uh, at the end of the session. Thanks. Um, oh, thank you so much for that talk, Adam. Um, you know, really, really fascinating. Um, I know for myself, when I first started learning about the effect of contrails, I was just astounded um, by how much they actually co contributed to climate change. Obviously, we all know a lot more about carbon dioxide. Um, and some of the things you're talking about in terms of you know, the software, it's really impressive. And the idea of turning that um, into a market for carbon credits, which is actually going to give airlines an incentive to engage with this. Um, you know, I think it's got huge potential. It's you know, a really exciting area. And um, congratulations, obviously, on the Etihad signing. So um, we'll be looking forward to hearing more Thanks about how much. that goes. <laughs>
Um, but so yeah, yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, and now we're on to um, our, our fourth speaker for the day. Uh, so Paul Williams is going to give us a slightly different take now on aviation and climate change um, and look actually at what we can expect in terms of the weather uh, which we might encounter as the climate um, does change and develop. So over to you, Paul. That's great. Many thanks, uh, Jess. And um, also a special mention to Robin Evans, who I think is on the call from the Balfa um, Environment Study Group for, for helping to set this up. Um, I suppose the first point to emphasise is that I'm obviously not a pilot or an air traffic controller. Um, I wouldn't have the foggiest clue how to fly a plane or control air traffic. That's absolutely your patch. And uh, whenever I fly, I'm just constantly in awe of the just the great job you do in keeping air travellers safe. Uh, what I do know about um, and what I've specialised in for the past 20 years, um, so when you guys were learning how to fly planes and control air traffic, I was uh, in the university library studying the atmosphere and turbulence, jet streams, um, atmospheric waves. So all of the phenomena in the fluid that aircraft have to fly through. And I've recently been applying that knowledge to analyse uh, what the impacts might be of climate change on the aviation sector and so that's going to be the focus of my talk. Um, so just to hammer that point home a little bit further, um, while this colloquium today so far has focused on the consequences of aviation for climate change, very important, very interesting topic, uh, what I'm going to address is actually the opposite question. Uh, how does climate change affect aviation? How is it affecting aviation today and how will it continue to affect aviation in the future? So this is very much a two way interaction, uh, although most of the scientific work and academic interest so far has been on this top arrow, you know, thousands of academic studies and seminars. Um, this bottom arrow is a relatively new topic, um, just a handful of papers, really, although I think it will be a rapidly growing topic, um, a very important one. So I suppose in a nutshell, I'm suggesting that we should be asking not only what is aviation doing to climate change, but also what is climate change doing to aviation? And the answer is uh, quite a lot, actually, I think, as I'll explain. Um, just another bit of the preamble before I get going. Um, there's an interesting conference he held. Um, I spoke at it a few years ago in Toulouse, the, a World Meteorological Organization conference on aeronautical meteorology. Um, and like all, I think, UN agencies conferences, it published a set of proceedings with an official set of recommendations and statements, um, approved statements. I'll just draw your attention to one of these, which I found particularly interesting. A changing climate scenario may render some of today's aerodrome, airspace and airframe design and operation standards inadequate in the years or decades to come. Using basically the past as an indicator of the future at an airport may be insufficient, given the rate at which the, uh, the world's climate is warming. Um, the World Meteorological Organization is like all UN agencies, quite, quite conservative. It, it doesn't rush into things. It doesn't say things lightly. So to read a statement like this is, is, is quite sobering. And I think it's an acknowledgement from the highest echelons of the United Nations Meteorological Agency that climate change is gonna have consequences for the way we fly. So this is just a quick outline um, for my 10 minutes. Um, and instead of a, a list of bullet points, I structured it as an infographic that I put together for an IKO report a few years ago. So these are the things I'm going to focus on in my talk, and I'll just give them a, a minute or two each. I'll talk about how many airports are coastal, and so rising sea levels coupled with storm surges threaten to, to flood low-lying airports. I'll talk about how warmer air um, reduces the maximum takeoff mass of an aircraft. I'll talk about more extreme weather, uh, lightning, um, more extreme events. I'll talk briefly about how modifying wind patterns, basically the jet stream, could shift optimal flight routes and journey times and fuel consumption. And I'll finish on what I've probably worked on most personally, um, the fact that stronger wind shears in the jet stream um, 
um, could and I believe are increasing the amount of clear air turbulence. So I'm just going to go through these one by one now and give you a, a well stocked tour. It really is going to be very fast, just skimming the surface, telling you what we know from existing studies on each of these five points. So let's start with rising sea levels. Uh, we know that many airports are located coastally, and partly that's because where people live. Uh, about 30% of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast, and so it makes sense for airports to be uh, near those large population centers. And of course, coastal airports tend to be low-lying, and therefore many of the world's busiest airports are just a, a few feet above sea level, um, here's an example of the of the US, um, San Francisco, just five feet above sea level, Honolulu. Uh, Louis Armstrong is actually a couple of feet below sea level, with obviously some, some defences in place. Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Reagan, Liberty, LaGuardia, JFK. And then on this side of the Atlantic, for example, Rome, um, and, and further to the east, Shanghai. So major hubs, just... just um, very small distances above current sea levels. Um, so the effects of sea level rise on coastal airport flooding has been studied and quantified. So just to give you some numbers, a recent comprehensive study calculated that the sea level rise from two degrees Celsius of global warming, we've already had one degree, so halfway towards two degrees, two degrees would result in sea level rise that would place about 100 airports around the world below sea level. Um, and of course, even an airport that is not below sea level can still get flooded by a storm surge and sea level rise is increasing that threat as well. Um, I'm just going to focus in now on LaGuardia, which is six or seven feet above sea level. So it's, it's above sea level currently, but still um, is at risk of flooding. And this is just some aerial footage of um, the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy back in 2012. LaGuardia was closed for three days. Um, both runways were underwater, the tarmac underwater, um, and quite a, a devastating event, not just for the airport, of course, but including the airport. Uh, fortunately, the storm surge didn't coincide with the high tide, and that was quite lucky. Um, I've seen estimates that the uh, terminal buildings would have been breached by the floodwaters if the storm surge happened at the same time as the high tide. Now, again, Another study here recently calculated that sandy-like flooding of New York um, will occur once every five years by the middle of this century because of sea level rise. The storm surges themselves aren't getting any worse because of climate change, so the volume of water in the storm surges is, is the same, but it's being added on to the rising sea level that is increasing that threat. So flooding of New York this bad that pre-industrially pre -industrially was a one in 500 year event so it would only have happened twice every millennium, is happening one every 25 years today, so four times a century. And as I say, within three decades, expected to happen once every five years. Moving on then to the increase of, of air temperature. Um, we know that every three degrees Celsius warming of air temperature reduces the density of the air by about 1%. And that reduces the lift that can be generated by an aircraft attempted to take off. Uh, basically what's happening is that when the air temperature is cold, the molecules are all close together, but when you warm it up, the molecules get spaced further apart. Um, and that means that the number of molecules per square centimeter um, available to, to push the airframe upwards is reduced. So the molecular collisions that transfer momentum is, is reduced. Um, as I say, by 1% for every three degree warming. It's equivalent to raising the altitude of the airport by 100 meters in terms of its impacts on the density. Again, this has been studied. Uh, here's a recent study I did with a colleague, Guy Graton. Um, so we've analyzed here um, historically changing takeoff conditions at Kios Airport in Greece. So we've taken historic observations. This is not a modeled future. This is what's already happened going back to the 1970s, it's obviously warmed at a rate of 0. so three quarters of a degree per decade. Um, interestingly, the component of the headwind along the runway direction has been decreasing as well at um, about 2.3 knots per decade. This could possibly be something called global stilling 
Um, we expect climate change to, to weaken the surface winds. Things are different higher up, but, it, but the surface, uh, a long-term global stilling, it's been called. What we do is we feed these historic temperatures and headwinds into an aircraft takeoff performance model for the Airbus A320. So a vertical force balance model that calculates the maximum takeoff mass um, much like the models that are used in operations to calculate the maximum takeoff mass. Um, and what we get is historic data on the maximum takeoff mass over time, and it's been significantly reducing at 132 kilograms annually. So that's roughly equivalent to one less passenger a year that can be carried at the maximum takeoff weight. Um, so just over, over the 30 year period since the a320 came into service in um, 1988, I think. Um, the maximum takeoff mass has reduced by about four tons. Um, of course, if, if the aircraft is nowhere near its maximum takeoff mass, this doesn't matter. But um, it, it is a, a consistent trend that we, we see. One solution to this might be to lengthen runways, of course, uh, but sometimes that's not possible. Um, more extreme weather. I'm focusing here on lightning. Um, the movie here is a, a footage of a NASA plane in the 80s that deliberately flew through one and a half thousand thunderstorms and sustained 700 lightning strikes, so all in the name of research. Um, we know that lightning flashes increase with temperature. Uh, there's more lightning in the tropics than the poles. There's hardly any lightning in the poles because it's too cold. Um, there's more lightning in summer than winter. There's more lightning during the daytime than nighttime. So there's a clear link between temperatures and lightning. So it stands to reason that as we warm up the atmosphere, we'll see more lightning strikes. And a study here indicates 12% more lightning strikes per degree Celsius of global warming. And because we expect a few degrees of global warming, that's about an increase of about 50% over this century. Might be a solution here as well. It turns out that if you charge the airframe negatively, um, it's less likely to be struck by lightning, interestingly. So that might be a, a way out of this problem is to artificially charge the airframe negatively and keep it negatively charged. It sort of it has a way of repelling the, the lightning and reducing the chances of the plane being struck. Moving on to the jet stream and flight times. Um, this is a study showing historic jet streams. We're up at um, about 40,000 feet here, showing the wind speed. So these are the jet streams up to 40 meters a second on average here across the Atlantic. Um, and the panel on the right shows the change um, that will have is projected to have occurred by the end of this century, according to 35 different models. We might not trust a single model on this, might take that with a pinch of salt, but when 35 models are giving a consistent pattern, which is what's happening here, then um, I suggest we should take it seriously. This is showing an increase in the jet stream winds. Um, so on a flight, for example, between JFK and LHR, you might expect 20 to 30 meter per second winds on average. This is all averaged, but an increase of two to three. So something like a 10% increase in the, in the prevailing winds. And um, we might expect this to change flight times. And we studied that as well, showing here sort of a control flight time distribution for eastbound and westbound in yellow and a, 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 a double CO2 um, distribution in red. So we do indeed fly in a shorter, a shift towards shorter flight times because of the stronger tailwinds. Um, the change is, is five, 10 minutes, nothing massive, although a lot of the interest is in the, if you look at the extreme events, we find that um, historically, there's been a very small chance of a flight taking under about five hours and 10 minutes between JFK and LHR. But as we warm the climate and, and increase the jet stream speed, we actually do see a significant probability of some really rapid eastbound crossings because of the tailwinds. And interestingly, the subsonic eastbound transatlantic flight um, time record has been broken quite a few times in the last few years. Five hours, 16 minutes in January 2015, five hours, 13 minutes in January 2018, and four hours, 56 minutes is the current record. So just right about here. I'm not saying climate change has necessarily caused these records to be broken, but it's certainly consistent with what we expect. And of course, longer uh, westbound journeys because of the um, uh, the headwinds strengthening. And finally, in my final minute or two, I'll talk about turbulence. We've been monitoring the jet stream and I'll focus here on clear air turbulence, which is caused by shear, wind shear in the jet stream. 
And because we've been observing the jet stream going back to the 1970s, we can see what's been happening to the wind shear and it's clearly been increasing. It's increased by 15%. So the jet stream at about 35,000 feet is 15% more strongly sheared today than it was when I was born in the late 70s. It's quite sobering. It's a clear trend. It's um, consistent among different data sets. And we expect this trend to continue um, a further increase by 17 to 29%, according to a recent study by the end of this century, depending on future emissions. What does this mean for turbulence? A 15% increase in wind shear doesn't mean a 15% increase in turbulence. It's more complicated than that. Um, turbulence generation is a, is a sort of threshold effect, and that, so it's very non-linear. So we've been crunching the numbers, and these are the percentage increases we expect in CAT um, by the period 2050 to 2080. This is, so this is moderate, the prevalence of moderate CAT um, at about 40,000 feet. Um, so there's there are weak reductions in the tropics, but we don't really care about that. There isn't much CAT in the tropics anyway. All of the interest is in the jet stream regions and the mid latitudes in both hemispheres. Um, but as you can see, we, we calculate increases of hundreds of percent in the probability of encountering moderate or severe CAT um, in, in the next few decades because of the, just the wind shear and the jet stream increasing uh, because of climate change. So I've had 15 minutes quickly summarizing sea level rise, threatening runway capacity, um, a reduction in maximum takeoff weights from the warmer air, lightning strikes increasing, a stronger jet stream speeding up eastbound flights and slowing down westbound flights. And there's a little asymmetry there in the maths that turns out that the cancellation doesn't actually occur and, and the round trip journeys are, um, are lengthened. Um, eastbound flights get a little bit quicker, but westbound flights get a lot longer just because of a little quirk in the mathematics. And finally, the jet stream now 15% more sheared than when satellites began observing it because of climate change, um, increasing the amount of severe cat by hundreds of percent in the coming decades. So that's my little summary of how climate change may affect the way we travel. Um, that's it for me. Do get in touch if you have any questions and I'll hand you back over to Jess and Jeremy now for the discussion. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that, Paul. Um, a yeah, really excellent talk. And um, you give us an awful lot to think about in just a short time there. Um, you know, certainly for me, with my flying experience, um, I learned to fly in Phoenix in Arizona. So when you're talking about um, temperature uh, changes, then I do remember having to take off even then in the morning because it's too hot in the afternoon, um, the expansion of that. Um, I didn't know about having a negative charge on aircraft to avoid lightning strikes. Um, so that's a, that's a really interesting one. Um, and certainly looking at the, I think your last graph there, the increase in cat of the Atlantic, being as I do spend a lot of my time going back and forth across the Atlantic, it does strike me that you know, where you've got some of your largest increases, they are also some of our most flown routes. Um, so I guess in summary, it really brings it home uh, to us as pilots that you know, we really can't just um, sit around with our heads in the sand. We do need to act on this, even if for purely selfish reasons, um, ideally um, for some slightly more altruistic reasons as well. So yeah, thank you so much for that. Yeah. Um, so what we're gonna go into now is uh, just a bit of a question and answer session, um, probably for just um, the next 10, 15 minutes. Um, I can see we've got a few uh, questions open already waiting to be answered. Um, so our first question is from Stu Clark. I'm not sure uh, which of the panellists is probably best to answer this. So anybody jump in um, if you feel you can. Um, so what Stu says is um, in his book, What Do We Need to Do Now? Chris Goodall says that we need a 20-fold increase in renewable energy generation capacity in future. That's a huge increase over current levels. However, bearing in mind the extremely energy-hungry nature of e-fuel production, is that a new enough to fuel aviation, um, especially long haul? Um, Roy Didier, I guess this really touches on um, your talk about production of uh, SAF. So are you able to comment on that at all? The only thing I can, I can say on this is indeed the number of aircraft uh, we will have uh, in the sky in the future will depend of our capacity uh, to produce renewable ele electricity in the future, or low, I would say, low carbon electricity. 
there is a direct link between between the two of them. Um, I don't know what how we will do and how we will achieve uh, the amount of electricity required. Uh, some experts uh, believe that uh, the only way to achieve this demand for renewable ele electricity in the future is to create a global, a worldwide a global grid of electricity with production, for example, of offshore winds south of uh, Greenland and uh, coming or uh, linking also the grid to, to deserts where we will have uh, solar production could, could probably be uh, our future. But definitely, if we fail to produce enough renewable electricity, we will not be able to develop this uh, low carbon aviation that we, that we try to achieve in the future and that we will have an impact on the global uh, aviation for sure. Great, thank you, thank you Didier. So that, that is one of the you know, big issues around this, that um, it is going to need huge amounts of renewable um, electricity generation. Thank you. Um, the next one is probably um, for you as well, actually. So uh, you've got a question asking, um, is it correct that SAF is currently only used as around 50% of the fuel load, plus around 50% fossil fuel? And if so, what needs to be done to increase the SAF percentage? It's purely a question of uh, certification. So for the moment, all our engines are certified to up to 50% or maximum of 50% of, uh, of SAF but uh, there is currently uh, processes uh, to develop new certification process and new engine that will allow uh, us to, to use up to 100% of SAF. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. It's, it's purely certification, but for sure the new generation of, um, of engine will be able to, uh, to use 100% of SAF. Great, thanks Didier. Um, so next, I'm not sure who wants to jump in for this one. Um, so anybody who feels that able to answer, do so. Um, so I have a question um, asking, uh, Corsia relies heavily on offsetting. Um, in reality, is it not that the aviation industry will remain dirty and is merely passing off its problems for others to clear up? Um, in addition, is it correct that Corsia and other measures are only looking for carbon neutrality for traffic growth from 2020? I can try. <laughs> Explaining Corsia in a few minutes, it's, 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 it's quite challenging. But the, uh, the, the objective of Corsia is to allow um, a grow, continuous growth of aviation um, with an offsetting of carbon offset uh, above a certain le uh, level. So last year, um, ICAO. A review Corsia objective that any growth of aviation above 2019 level of emission will have to be offset via program of uh, offsetting, like uh, planting trees in uh, Guatemala, for example, or using a sustainable aviation fuel to compensate for the um, for the additional emission above the level of 2019. So indeed, Corsia is, as, does not have the objective to reduce uh, the emission. It's only to compensate above a certain level. This objective may be reviewed next year. There will be a big uh, conference about the objective of Corsia in 2022. Uh, but the main uh, complaint we receive about Corsia for the moment is that is not Corsia is not in line with what should be done in aviation if we want to achieve a net zero carbon emission by 2050. Great, thank you, Didier. Um, Jamie, did you want to add anything to that? Or Yeah, if I can press the right button. Yeah, thanks, Didier. Uh, it's a very good question. And you have to bear in mind that Corsia is attempting to unite almost all countries across the world, which is a phenomenally difficult thing to do. And it's also quite a slow process. So its targets are based on the thinking from 10 or 12 years ago. So in today's context, it doesn't look very ambitious. 
But you do need to bear in mind that it's not the only targets we're looking at, and there's much more ambitious targets and measures in place in Europe, in the UK, and the US as well now. And we expect other countries as well to step up. So Corsio can be considered a good result in terms of a success of international cooperation, but its environmental target is modest. And we look at it more as a starting point and also as a bit of a backstop if other measures don't succeed, at least there's a minimum standard to work to. Brilliant, um, thanks Jeremy and Didier. Uh, next question, uh, this is probably one for you, Paul, if that's okay. Um, so a question here saying, uh, you talked about jet stream speed increasing, um, but I started long call in 1979. And what I've noticed in recent years, are there directions with jet streams running north to south uh, which have increased dramatically from my early years of mainly west east yes thanks that's an interesting one um of course the jet stream is supposed to blow from west to east um but there is a theory i mean it's not i wouldn't say this was completely accepted yet but there's an emerging idea in climate science that and this all goes back to the fact that the arctic regions are warming faster than the tropics that's because there's a lot of ice of course, in the Arctic, and, and that reflects sunlight back to space, so it has a cooling effect. But as the ice melts away, that sunlight gets absorbed by the Arctic Ocean instead. And that, so there's an amplified sort of a feedback, amplified warming. And that's reducing the north-south temperature difference, which is what I, why we have a jet stream in the first place, is that it's cold in the poles and it's warm in the tropics. That's what's going on dynamically. So as climate change reduces that temperature gradient at ground level, it's actually very different at flight cruising levels, it's, it's the opposite. Um, but there is a theory that the reduction in the north-south temperature gradient at ground level may be causing the jet stream to become wavier. So instead of just blowing in a straight line, well, it never does this anyway, but instead of blowing in a straight line all the way around the world um, in the northern hemisphere, it starts to, to get wiggles in it and go, go sort of north and south, um, called Rosby waves in atmospheric science and there's a theory that um, this effect will increase because of climate change and some people say there's already evidence that it has and this has consequences for our weather as well because when one of these waves develops it, it can sort of get locked in place in, a, in the, what's called a blocking event and, and just sit there for long periods of time causing extreme weather um, so extreme heat in summer extreme um, cold and, and snow in, in winter so this is not settled. I'm sure we've got a lot more digging to do um, to figure out exactly how climate change is modifying the jet stream, but there is emerging evidence to support what you've anecdotally observed, um, which is the jet stream is, is tending to go north and south rather than just straight to the, to the east. Um, I think we'll, you know, in, in the next few years, we'll get a much more complicated and comprehensive picture of exactly what's going on there. But it's interesting that you, you feel you've, you've observed it. It was Michael, wasn't it, in your in your flying career? But yeah, um, thank you, Paul. I can see, um, Michael, you have your hand up. So, did you want to um, to ask a follow up question on that? Uh, I didn't have my hand up. I'm like Jeremy. I obviously uh, pressed the wrong button, but that's pilot. <laughs> um, uh, and no, I think um, Paul has answered my uh, my question, um, because certainly in the early days, it was purely east-west. Yes, it would wave. Um, but now I can recall a flight I did to the Caribbean before I, just before I retired. I'd never seen a jet stream literally go from the North Pole until it petered out somewhere quite close to the equator or sort of the tropics. And um, it was absolutely astonishing. And it, and it wasn't a weak jet stream. It was quite a, a powerful, strong a jet stream and I remember at the time reading it was bringing obviously some pretty cold weather, unusually cold weather to uh, the Canaries and uh, regions like that so uh, I'll put my hand now. Right, thanks Michael yeah um, and it's interesting too you know the, the anecdotal side of it um, as opposed to the science side um, which Paul has been able to give us. Um, we did have a question um, for Adam. Adam has had to go, unfortunately. I think it's probably one uh, worth uh, talking about, at least briefly. Um, so the question was, uh, could it be that avoiding contrail production results in less efficient flight profiles for carbon dioxide reduction? Uh, and I think it's a really good question. Um, 
uh, and I'll have a go at answering it. And then, you know, uh, Jeremy, or you know, please jump in as well. Because um, I think, you know, yes, if you're flying a different flight profile from your most efficient for carbon dioxide to contrails, there will be a small increase in carbon dioxide emissions. Um, so it's balancing that off um, against uh, the reduction in heating, which you can get from avoiding contrails. I think some of the figures which Adam did show us in his talk are really interesting that I think on the flight, they said they actually did in practice and obviously spent quite a lot of time analysing um, they're able to save 64 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent by the contrails for only an extra 100 kilograms of fuel burn. Um, so as so though there is the extra fuel burn there, but it sounds like, you know, if you look at it in whole, um, it's very much worth it. Um, I don't know if any of the other panellists have anything they want to um, uh, come in on on that question as well. Yeah, there's um, been a few studies oh. on this. Um, I think there was one in Japan, there's one around the New York area. And there's a lot of uncertainty because it depends on the strategy you use. But the, uh, the figures we're seeing are typically 1% to 2% extra CO2 burn across the entire fleet. Um, but they're looking at the benefit outweighing that by something like 30 to 50 times in total uh, terms of overall warming. So it'll be a small increase in cost for the airlines, uh, which is why if this is going to work. Uh, once it's been proven to work, then it's going to need some regulatory input to make sure it actually happens. Mm. Yeah, and uh, there might be a difference between daytime flying and nighttime flying as well. Uh, interestingly, contrails having, have a warming effect because they absorb the outgoing energy from, from Earth's surface. Uh, but that's partly offset by the fact that they reflect incoming energy from the sun back to space. Um, and of course, during the nighttime, there isn't any of that. So it's just 100% warming effect. Um, so there is the, this idea that nighttime flying is is worse, has more of a warming effect because at least during the day, um, some of the energy gets some of the sun's energy gets reflected back to space, and that will partly offset it. So um, I don't know whether this has implications for flying more during the daytime. Be as being sort of preferential, it's not always possible, of course. Maybe maybe it's too hot and you have to fly at night because um, yeah, all sorts of effects going on. Yeah, got to say as a pilot that anything that avoids night flights um, is going to be good by me. Um, yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, so probably got time for just a couple more questions now. Uh, so a nice challenging one from uh, Stu Clark here, who says, uh, thinking specifically about aviation, uh, was COP26 a success or a failure? Does anyone want to jump in on that? Um, Jeremy, do you want to go first? Um, it's very keen. Um, I might be wrong, but I didn't see very much that was actually specific or new uh, for aviation. It seemed to prefer the transport day focused mostly on ground, ground transport, uh, but I, I'm very willing to be corrected on that. Yeah, I think that's right, Jeremy. Um, I actually saw the question. I've had a quick Google. So there is a there is a COP26 declaration on International Aviation Climate Ambition Coalition. It's got a few details in. It talks about Corsia, talks about committing to limiting the temperature increase to one and a half degrees, um, taking steps domestically to implement Annex 16 of the Chicago Convention as fully as possible. I mean, it all sort of sounds good. Um, ad advancing the environmental ambition of Corsia. Um, and I can't see anything mentioned there, but I, I, think, I think we all know that there'll have to be a Corsia 2. I think Corsia One expires at some point. Can't remember exactly when. It's not really my 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 patch. The the, the politics of it or the, this socio-economic side of it. But I think Corsia has a has an endpoint, and there'll need to be a, a Corsia Two that's a bit more aggressive. But um, yeah, I think you're right, Jeremy. There's nothing there that's any just a, a re a reaffirmation of existing. I think um, commitments basically. Brilliant. Thank you both. Um, okay, so we've got um, just one more question now. It's probably a good one to. Uh, finish off with anyway. Um, so, so there's a question to all the panellists, so maybe you could each sort of give your views in turn. Um, and the question is, what for you is the single biggest challenge for making aviation more sustainable? And what can we do to help try and solve this? Uh, so how about, um, Paul, do you want to start off and you give your, your views on that first? And then we'll um, ask Didier and Jeremy as well what they think. Uh, well, Didier's and Jeremy's points of view will be much more 
well developed, I think, than mine. Um, but um, the biggest challenge, I mean, miniaturizing electric batteries, I think, is a, is a big is a big challenge. Um, they're just simply too heavy um, at the moment, and I think we do expect them to miniaturize over time. Um, Yes, but still probably limited just to short haul. I mean, but it'd be really nice to 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 see a breakthrough in the the, the power density, the you know the amount of energy that can be packed into a battery at not very much weight. Um, so that's uh, I know people, people, scientists, engineers are actively working on on this in in research mode, and um, I suppose I'm sort of ho hoping for a breakthrough in that area so that we can uh, go a bit further using electric um, as a sort of a different. Uh, way forward compared to um, SAFs, which are, of course, part of the mix as well. We need all of these things in the mix, of course. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, uh, Didier, what, what would be your take on that question? I believe that uh, aviation future is linked to, the, to our energy transition. We need energy. We need a lot of energy to, uh, to fly in, in the skies. And uh, we need to succeed this energy transition to low carbon uh, to continue to have um, um, success aviation and a growth in aviation. So that's for me the biggest challenge. Uh, it's not directly linked to what needs to do uh, aviation because aviation of course can, can focus on uh, technological improvement um, but the rest, development of sustainable aviation fuel based on biofuel or based on electrofuel, which is directly linked to production of renewable electricity, is not in our hands. Uh, we need to promote it. Uh, we need to convince um, everybody that, yes, aviation is part of the energy transition in, uh, and it needs to be a success and it will be a huge, huge challenge. But, but I, I will repeat what I said, the number of aircraft we will have in the future uh, will depend of our success in this energy transition. So that's where we need to put our focus as well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and uh, Jeremy then, uh, you get to have the final word. Well, it's interesting. I think just in the last six months, um, we are in a position where we know what our targets are. We know what technologies could be put towards solving them. None of them are impossible. They all need a lot of work and they're all going to cost a lot of money. So the biggest challenge, I think, is a huge amount of political willpower is needed and a really huge amount of investment is needed now to make all this happen. Great, thank you. Um, so that uh, wraps uh, wraps up our session. So uh, to everybody who's attended um, in person, I really hope you enjoyed it. And everybody who is watching on Catch Up um, as well, I hope you found it interesting and informative. Um, obviously this session has been recorded. It will be made available live um, in the next uh, few days and uh, we'll be promulgating links uh, for anybody who's attended today, uh, then a feedback form uh, should appear as you leave the session. So we would be really grateful uh, for any feedback you're able to give us. Um, and we do have the uh, final session in this whole uh, sequence of talks. Uh, that's next week on the 22nd. And that's going to be a controller pilot interface with a chance to uh, join in the discussion um, and ask questions. So if you've enjoyed this session, then I would recommend that one as well. Um, so really just finally, it remains me to say, you know, thank you so much to our speakers for giving up your time to come along today. Um, I certainly have found, I've learned a lot uh, during it. It's been you know, absolutely fascinating. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you as, as well to everybody who's attended. Um, really hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>